Go ahead, Eric. Please come forward for the lighting of our fourth candle. Please join me. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and our joy. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Please remain standing for our call to worship. Uh, for our call to worship, Jesus' birth is divine because God intervened in history to send His Son. God continues to give Himself through His Son that all who recognize His divine origin may find Him. Please lift up your voices for the first Noel. No. 
Please be seated. And let us pray our unison prayer together. Almighty God, whose order in creation makes every birth a miracle, but who ordered Jesus' birth to be uniquely divine, become real in our lives as we put our faith in Jesus, your Son, that we may know you have come to be with us in everyday life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage everyone to read our passages of Scripture for today. The first comes from the Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16, and then from Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7 and 17 through 19, then to our epistle, Romans 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. I will be sharing with you from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the prophet, what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. May God add his richest blessings to the reading and the hearing of his holy, holy word. Please stand as you are able, for what child is this?
Please be seated. Carpenter 
a man who was probably more comfortable with working with his hands than talking, uh, was, was full of doing things with the right tool at the right job for the right uh, time. In Christmas pageants, we all know who the star is, right? Mary. Mary, as she takes front and center, up until that time with the birth of Jesus announced. And some pageants, if they're big enough, and some churches, if they're large enough, will have a newborn baby there portraying Jesus. Uh, I know when we were in, in Holy Cross, um, we had a lot of young people, and we were able to use um, uh, not a real newborn, but one that was only about a month old as baby Jesus. Um, and they had been used to kind of doing things more in an elaborate way uh, of portraying and even had a, um, a cantata um, that they would perform for the public. Uh, and how powerful that is when you get to see it. We, on the other hand, um, I don't know, did we ever use Elizabeth? I think we, we did use Elizabeth because Elizabeth was born here. So we were able to, to, to have uh, that child. But until Elizabeth, we had a baby doll baby, baby. <laughs> that uh, uh, portrayed Jesus. Uh, but the real star at the beginning of that pageant is, is Mary. Um, and when we think back, um, you know, most of the girls that are lining up for the parts, who do they want to be? Mary, at front and center. You know, you're, you're, you have all the eyes upon you. Um, then, you then there's the angel. Um, how about the boys? How many boys really want to be Joseph? Not very many. Not very many. They would rather be what? The wise men, one of the three kings, holding something that they had, whether it was gold or frankincense or myrrh, or a shepherd. Shepherds were cool, man. They had that, that, that crook uh, to, to hold on to that staff. Um, and you could do a lot of naughty things with that staff. Um, I know because I was there as a child and Unfortunately, I confess that I did them as well. Uh, but anyway, um, we grow up. Don't we? Well, I'm still working on it, Judy. <laughs> but being Joseph is not one that people want to be. And yet, I think there is something very profound with Joseph. If Mary was to be the first one to hear the good news of the birth of Christ, Joseph was certainly the second. But for Joseph, think about it, the news that Mary was pregnant was not anything good at all to hear. It would come as quite a shock, for he knew that the baby within her was not his. Our gospel story tells us Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child. Now in those days, there were two steps to a marriage. There was the betrothal, uh, where you are, leave, you are married, but not in the full context. So there is that courtship where you are bound legally to one another uh, as if you were married but you're not living together and that can take up to about a year and then there is the marriage that takes place where the two do uh, are, are married before the eyes of god and will remain living together as husband and wife uh, but if anything happens in that betrothal uh, situation, it then must be handled um, in, in a legal manner to dissolve that relationship. It was legally um, uh, the same as getting a divorce. 
Mary and Joseph are in this first stage of their, of their relationship, legally bound to one another, awaiting the day of their marriage when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. So that's not good news for Joseph. It's bad news, very bad news for him. And Joseph, like any man in his position, must have felt hurt, must have felt humiliated, disappointed, and even angry. But Joseph was a man of few words. At least that's what Matthew, well, Matthew doesn't tell us, but he doesn't tell us any of the sayings that Joseph says. So therefore, we can deduce that he doesn't say much, but he acts on what happens. Joseph was that ordinary man, a carpenter by trade. He learned that the woman that he was engaged to was pregnant, and he knew that the baby wasn't his. And so he drew the obvious conclusion. What more is there to be said? But Matthew tells us that Joseph was also a righteous man, which means that Joseph loved God, that Joseph tried to follow God's law. Now, in all things, a righteous man will try to follow the commands of God. So when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, he turns to God's law for guidance. And according to the law, he has two options. The first option is to bring charges against Mary in public. Now, if he was to do that, the charges comes with a penalty for adultery of death for Mary. And he could not handle that. So what he did do was the second option, which was to take care of this matter in a private manner, uh, where he, all he needed was two witnesses to sign a writ of paper saying that I divorce you, and for them to recognize that that is being handed over to Mary, and then the marriage would be dissolved. Now, ladies, I know it doesn't sound quite right that a man could do that, but unfortunately, in that society, then that culture, that was the way that things had ha would happen. Uh, but there was no penalty if it was handled that way. And that was what Joseph had decided to do. Why? Because Joseph was a righteous man. He had those options to choose from, and he could not disregard the law because of his being so righteous. So he put his will up alongside of God's will and the law. And he decided to do it privately so that it would not be public information that would disgrace Mary in the process. But, as we all know, God's Righteousness is always tempered with grace, with mercy. And Joseph receives an extraordinary gift. That is, through the light he receives in a dream, a visitation from an angel. And the Lord says through that angel, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her womb is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Now this is an amazing, amazing revelation. And yet, how does Joseph respond to this extraordinary news? He responds like an ordinary, righteous man would. When he awoke from his dream, he did as the angel had commanded. He needed no extra words. He needed no extra explanation. And therefore, he took young Mary 
who was with child, to be his bride. Mary, when she received information that she was about to give birth, what was her response? She said, how can this be? But Joseph was older, the fruit of maybe a lifetime of devotion to God's law, are eyes and with eyes and ears that are attuned to the Lord. Joseph would have known the passage from Isaiah that said, look, the virgin will, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So when Joseph awoke, after the angel of the Lord had appeared to him, he took Mary to be his wife with no extra words, no extra ex explanation. Joseph, that ordinary man, that faithful man, a man of few words, did as the Lord had commanded him. And he had done it for all of his life. Now the wonder of this story is that through the faithfulness of an ordinary man, God was doing something extraordinary. Now, it wasn't just to a, from an ordinary man, but from an ordinary woman with Mary as well. But Mary usually gets her two years uh, of recognition. Joseph only gets one out of three. So um, we'll, 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 we'll give that to him. He's not always in the background, but he has a very important part. Uh, uh, Mary conceiving the child and giving birth, to God's son and being the mother of Jesus, Joseph of being the father, the earthly father, the protector of that family. Um, just being an ordinary person, but doing an extraordinary job. The amazing news that God is sending his son to be born of a virgin, to be the savior and redeemer of the world, is working itself out in the faith and obedience of a very humble man like Joseph. The angel proclaims the miraculous news that God is coming among us as a little baby. And unlike Mary, who responds with joyful <coughs> exuberance by saying, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my Savior. Often known as the Magnificat, um, Joseph speaks no great words. Joseph was not a big talker. He was a carpenter. He was a practical man. But Joseph was a faithful man. He didn't need to make a big show of it. He listened to God's word, and he tried his best to follow it. And when God spoke to Moses, Moses, in, to Moses, to Joseph in a dream, Joseph got up and did as the Lord commanded him. He married Mary. He got them to Bethlehem. He named the child Jesus. And in another dream, he took the child to Egypt for the protection of his life and protected them until he was able to go out on his own. And through this no-nonsense, faithful response, God was working out his plan for, sal for the salvation of the whole world. My friends, we, too, are ordinary people. We, too, can be as faithful as Joseph was. And who knows, as in our faithfulness, what God may have planned for us and for our world. My friends, believe and live. And even if we are ordinary, God can do extraordinary things through us. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we do give you thanks for the way that you have worked through history. You have selected ordinary people to do extraordinary things. 
You have done that since the beginning of time. And Lord, as we gather here, our world still needs ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Continue to speak to the faithful. Continue to work your will upon us. Continue to give your message to those who will listen so that they may respond out of faithfulness. Help us to hear your will. Help us to see the light that you are shining down upon us. And Lord, guide us and bless us for the days that are yet to come. Work through us and beyond us, for our world still needs your presence, power, and grace. And Lord, as we are about to celebrate Jesus' birth, we also await his coming again, as he has promised to do, when the time is right, and when that, and in that full, fullness of time that you send him back to our world. Surround us with our love of you and your love of us and our love of each other. Guide us and bless us for all the days that are yet to be. And Lord, as we gather, we pray for our sick. We pray for those that are on our concern list, those that we name in our hearts, those, whatever the physical need, whatever the emotional need or the mental need, come upon each according to their need. Fill them with your touch. Bring healing to their minds, to their bodies, to their spirits. That they may give you the thanks and the praise in their living. We pray for wisdom, Lord, for our leaders, for our world. We pray for peace, for justice for a world without conflict. But Lord, we pray for each other, and we pray for your presence to be with us, guiding, blessing, sending, and receiving us. Come to us again this Christmas. Be born anew in our hearts that we may have that excitement and that expectation of what you are doing, that joy that, over, that exceeds all joy possible, that people, when they see us, will be able to feel that joy radiating from our hearts, from our minds, from our bodies, from our spirits that they too will radiate that joy throughout the entire world. Lord, for those that have upcoming procedures and tests, we pray for them. Reassure them of your power, of your grace, of your healing touch that is working through the doctors and nurses and medications and procedures. Guide them, bless them, and enable them to see and to feel your presence. Be with those that will be traveling. Watch over them to and fro. And Lord, keep them safe on the road and when they get back home. Guide us and bless us. We are your children. We ask these things in Christ's name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And Lord, accept the gifts of the clippers for the giving tree and for the offering that we have placed upon entering or upon departing the church. May they be used for your glory and not our own. In Christ's name. At this time, let us stand for angels we have heard on the high. For angels, well, wait a second. Angels we have heard on high. love and 
his Son be born anew in you. May his Spirit guide you and bless you now and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.